Welcome uh, to our uh, second webinar in the Moving Forward series. I am JJ McMurtry, the Dean of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and thank you so much to our panelists. Um, and also thank you to our host, Associate Dean Lily Cho. You'll be hearing more from our panelists and Associate Dean Cho shortly. I'd like to now acknowledge the fact that many of us, wherever we are in Toronto, across Canada, or across the world, are sitting on the traditional territories of different Indigenous peoples. Although we aren't in the same location, we recognize many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and it is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. So welcome again to our guests and to everybody joining us on Zoom to the next chapter in the Moving Forward webinar series. During this panel, we will address how society and our organizations are moving forward on equity and justice. Our alumni panelists will share their unique insights on how to promote women's leadership in 2020 and beyond. If at any time you need help with this experience or have questions for the panelists about the content, feel free to click on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Our team is here and ready to help you. So that's all from me. I'll hand things over now to Associate Dean Lily Cho, who will introduce our guests. Thanks so much, Lily. Thank you, JJ. Welcome, everybody. It's so lovely to see you all here today and to welcome you back virtually to York University and the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. I am so thrilled to be with you today and to introduce our panelists. We know that leadership amongst for women and having women leaders is more important now than ever. And so today we have so much to talk about and we're so lucky to have an extraordinary panel of accomplished alumni to talk to us about women in leadership. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and then we will begin our discussion. And so first I would like to invite Terry Ellis to come on screen and step up to the table and tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, so hi everyone, uh, thank you for having me. I think this is a really important conversation and I, I, I'm not sure it happens often enough. So my name is Terry Ellis. I am, am a graduate of York University. I was an English graduate. Uh, I currently am a partner at RSM Canada and RSM, if for those of you who don't know, is an accounting tax and advisory firm. I'm responsible for building out something called an alliance program, which is first uh, a first in Canada for our industry as an entirety, which is a think channel partnership program for CPA firms. Thanks. Thanks so much, Terry. Next, I would like to invite Jane Evans to come on screen and join our webinar. Hi, Jane, if you could please welcome, or please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jane Evans. I'm, uh, I'm really honored to be here, particularly with such an illustrious panel. It's, uh, it's, really, it's really wonderful to have been invited. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be back with, uh, with my alma mater. I graduated from York University with an undergrad degree in liberal studies. It was a very broad hum humanities, um, philosophy, all kinds of mishmash of stuff that I got to put together myself. So I, I love the multidisciplinary nature of my education at York. It really, really set me up for success. I, uh, I work at BMO Financial Group. Uh, we're a big bank. We're um, the eighth largest bank in North America. We have almost an equal presence in the US as we have in Canada through the Midwest, headquartered in Chicago. A lot of people in Canada don't know that about us. I lead a group called um, People, Process and Change as part of the Human Resources Function. Thanks again for having me. Thanks so much, Jane. We're so excited to hear from you today. Uh, next, I'd, I'd like to invite Janet Hawkins up onto the screen. Hi, Janet. And Hi. if you could please tell us about yourself. 
Great. Yeah. Th again, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, participate today. Looking forward to it. Um, I'm Janet. I am also an English major, went to York, um, and I am a CEO and co-founder of a SaaS tech company called Opteris. Um, and you probably haven't heard of us, even though we're a global company. We uh, provide a communication task management um, solution for retailers globally in you know, several languages uh, around the world and uh, have been doing that for the last 10 years. Thank you so much, Janet. And next, I would like to invite Anika Holder to join us on screen. Hi, Anika. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Anika Holder. Um, it's so odd to think that it's been almost 22 years, if you can believe it, since I walked through your claims in the commons. Although I can say I've been to the Rogers Cup since, um, probably in the last six years, but to actually walk through and feel the energy of the commons I haven't been able to do. So I'm so glad to be with you all. I graduated in 98 with a BA in sociology. I actually originally started a double major before graduating. I was a double major in sociology and African studies, but ended up with sociology. Uh, and then went on to study human resources. And I'm now the head of human resources at Canada's largest publisher, Penguin Random House Canada. And I'm just happy to be here with you all. Oh, it's so great to have you, Anika. Thank you for being here. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to invite Sandeep Tatla to join us on screen. Hi everyone. Um, just like all the other panelists, I'm really excited to be here today and thank you all for the opportunity to share. Uh, I am a graduate of the law and society and psychology program, so I had a double major and I graduated in 2001. Um, and I am also really excited uh, to actually actually visit the campus again. We were just talking about it early on. I'm currently the Vice President, um, Head of Diversity, Inclusion and Corporate Social Responsibility at Point Click Care, which is another software as a service cloud-based provider of um, health uh, software in the senior care industry. So really timely given what has been happening with COVID. Um, happy to be here and looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Sandeep. And it occurred to me, I didn't really tell you much about myself. I am uh, an associate dean in the Faculty of Global Arts and Professional Studies, but I'm also an English professor. So being on this panel just makes my heart explode with happiness. <laughs> this in so many ways. Uh, and I am really excited to have this conversation with you. And I'm going to start with a question about, you know, thinking, you know, if you think about yourself as a student, especially as an undergraduate student, and then you think about where you are now, you know, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what advice you would give either to your past self or to current students about shaping yourselves for leadership. You know, I think that when I think about being an undergraduate student, I didn't always think of it, of my experience of being a student in terms of leadership. But in fact, you know, all of it was training towards an idea of leadership that I didn't always understand, I think. Um, and so I, I am going to just call on you almost at random <laughs> um, to, to let me know what you think about that. And Janet, I wonder if I could ask you to start. I'm um, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Um... I think you're right. I think sometimes leadership comes naturally uh, and you don't necessarily know you're off on that path until um, the men around you start calling you tenacious and pushy. <laughs> so I, I wear those labels very proudly. If I, uh, in my business experience, if I hear one more man call me tenacious, you know, uh, but when they do, I say thank you very much. I take that as a compliment because um, you just have to, my advice to, to, to younger people is be you, say, stay strong. Um, cause that's what being tenacious is, right? You're holding firm to your ideas. You're standing up for yourself. You're determined. And to me, all those things are positive. So uh, my advice would be not to let anybody squash that out of you. Ten tenacity and be unsquashed in this autumn season of other squashes. <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Uh, Sandeep, do you have thoughts about this question? Yeah, absolutely. So I think my advice to my younger self, but also to those of all of you on the call or on the Zoom is, I really think that you've got to, and it's aligned with a bit what Janet said, but it's really um, charting your own path, right? If you think about leadership is you don't want to follow the pack because then you're just one of. So you really want to think about 
um, what is it that you want to do? What, what about you is unique and what perspective do you bring? And lead with that. Um, and that's sometimes hard. I think even as a leader now, I struggle with it to always think about, well, what is it that's true to who I am? What perspective do I bring? What, what do I see that others don't see and how do I bring voice to that? Um, because that is what will differentiate you as a leader, but it'll also make leadership that much easier because you're actually falling back on who you are versus trying to follow somebody else's path of what leadership should be. Thank you so much. I, you know what, could I follow up on and, and, and that just a little bit? As you were talking, yeah. I was thinking about how hard it is to get to know ourselves and to get to the core of, you know, what our strengths are, what, what our who we are as people and what we're bringing to the world. And I wonder if you found that, you know, in some ways studying uh, in the humanities and liberal arts allowed you to get a little bit closer to some of those questions about yourself and your identity and what, you know, what you bring. And this is something I'll, I'll open up to the other panelists too shortly, but I thought I would follow up with you just now. Yeah, you know what? So I didn't share, um, I also have a law degree. Um, so I practiced law for a while. And when I reflect on the um, and which one I would say has really shaped more of who I am, absolutely the York, the, my liberal arts degree for a whole host of reasons, especially because I wasn't following some rote path, right? I loved that just, um, I think one of the other panelists said that she was able to sort of carve together what interested her and in, in take that. And even though I double majored within that double major, there was so much flexibility to really lean into the things that spoke to me. So I took Caribbean studies classes, I took political science courses, I took, you know, so like I took a wide gamut of courses, but those that just spoke to me, those that I was interested in, and that really helps shape your understanding and lets you, for me anyway, let me know that I don't have to like, do one thing. Um, and as I've sort of grown into my career, I've been more drawn to thinking about how do I actually balance myself out and what else, what am I missing? What areas should I be thinking about more so? So absolutely the liberal arts degree did so where if I, and I'm going to just take a second, but with the law degree, there's a clear path, right? Like you, you, Everyone, everyone does the same courses. And then in your, your second year, you get to have some variants of courses, but then everyone articles and then everyone goes down this partnership and it's like a linear line. And so to start to show your individuality is, is much less. So I like, I like how you linked it up to the liberal arts and the ability to kind of learn and try different things. Thanks so much. I know I, I was just thinking about that and about how hard it is to take a path that isn't always clear and how much courage and actual leadership that already involves. And in fact, I think, um, Jane, you were the one who talked about how a liberal studies degree allowed you to just sort of put a bunch of different things together. So I wonder if yeah. you could talk about that maybe and, and, and your advice for younger women sure. now. Uh, sure. Thanks. Sure. Well, I, I definitely had the experience where a multidisciplinary education gave me a real breadth of knowledge and gave me the opportunity to be curious and to intellectually explore. And, and I think that that basic capability around curiosity is, um, is something that we don't maybe put enough investment in throughout the rest of our lives. You know, that, that in the volatile, uncertain, ambiguous world that we find ourselves in right now in particular, but I think it, it'll be sustained. I don't think this is a one, one shot degree of, of ambiguity and, and uncertainty. I think we're gonna continue to see the acceleration of change in the world. Having the ability to put different ideas together and find cohesion, the ability to think systemically across multiple different perspectives that critical thinking and that integrative thinking, I think is what really stood me in great stead as I launched into a career. And, and I guess my advice would be find your purpose, find your passion, because that's what you throw yourself into. And that's what you become deserving of becoming a leader of. You know, this is about inspiring followership. I'm not talking about being, you know, a, 
a, a big personality that that invites um, you know worship. I'm, I'm talking about being um, someone who can really make the world a better place by virtue of the mastery that you have and your ability to chart a course through that ambiguity because you're passionate, because you have a call to action that you really want to make make something better, no matter how small it is, no matter how big it is. That transformational journey, I think, is what the world needs more of. That's so helpful. Thank you. And and I, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking about how, you know, you're almost presaging the next question, but I want to bring Annika and Terry into it. But I was thinking about how, when I think about leaders, I really admire and respect. It's not the people who want me to replicate them, um, but it's the people who invite me to find my own narrative um, and how right. that narrative then contributes to the team or to the larger project that we're working on and and you know and I wonder now if I could turn um, the the mic over to Anika and, and ask you to talk a bit about you know any of these questions are, and especially since you work so much in, in narrative in so many ways but also about advice you might have for, for thinking about leadership now yeah thank you um I think I would, you know, everything that's been said so far really much echoes the way I feel about leadership and also applying your journey as a student to your development as a leader. Um, for Will, I, you know, I think that having a, an education, especially within the humanities and uh, liberal arts at York, I think is an opportunity to build the qualities that I believe are the best qualities in a leader, self-awareness, empathy, resiliency and the ability to adopt. Um, you know, having a university education is a privilege and it's also for many of us probably has been a feat, meaning that it wasn't easy for us to get there, one, and also to afford it. And so I think that, you know, harnessing those characteristics are really key as leaders. Um, I spend most of my time really thinking about how we bring people, call people in, in a culture and also get their best. And I think those are the, the, the qualities I would say anchor the best in a leader. Um, I would also say, uh, you know, all the reading that you do, like if you see all the books behind me, I had to recollect everything over the years. I spent a lot of reading. I too also spent a lot of did Caribbean studies and being in African studies, did a lot of literature courses in addition to my sociology. So I'm sure many of you are also doing lots of reading and reading actually has a clear link to building empathy and compassion because you get to be into the, you get to, to participate in the worlds of other people, whether they're fictional or not. And I think that's a very um, strong characteristic that you wanna build as you uh, go on to your uh, leadership, just your journey overall together. I think that leadership doesn't always mean that you're leading others, uh, leading yourself and, and, and by leading by example, which is just being authentic is all part of leadership. I love all of this so much. I uh, thank you. And I, I want to, to invite Terry now to, to tell us a bit also about what, what you're thinking about as you're listening to this and thoughts about advice and leadership for you. Yeah, I don't I don't think that I would not concur with all the rest of the panelists, right? A lot of the language is very similar. Authenticity, lead from where you are. Uh, it is a journey. If I look at my own career, my own career path, it's been a massive journey. And, and if I had is I'm reflecting because our firm, when we think about how we're bringing our leaders up through our organization, we focus on these words there. We call them the five C's. And when I first heard this, I thought to myself, well, oh, these are just words, but now I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it from this group of ladies. Uh, we call caring is the first sign of a true leader, curiosity. Are you trying to really understand? Are you collaborative? Are you working with others to really bring ideas or seek feedback, uh, seek feedback on what they think that your skill set is? Um, critical thinking, really asking those tough questions. I, I look back at, I had a very diverse education I, I couldn't actually figure out which one I where I wanted to focus because it was so diverse and I loved everything that I was doing. So being able to critically think and gather some of that feedback around collaboration. 
And then the fifth one is courageous and be courageous. And I think if, if I had to sit where all the students are sitting today and listen to this panelists, <laughs> I, I'd want to hear someone say, be prepared to fail and it's okay to fail. And if you're going to fail, fail fast. Because that's where all of my learning has come from. If I think about what I've, my greatest learning and how I've become where I am today, it really is because I failed. <laughs> and some of them were huge doozies, right? So, so be, be courageous enough to fail and take that risk, I think would be the only thing I'd add that you haven't already heard. <laughs> Which is Thank so you so much. <laughs> Although that's, that's so scary, right? The idea of allowing yourself to fail, giving yourself permission to fail. And especially, I think, as, as women where we're, you know, we just, I, I don't know about you, I just feel like, you know, I'm not allowed to ever take a, a wrong step, you know, that I feel like I, you know, that I'm being scrutinized. And then if I don't follow, you know, a certain kind of path that looks more familiar to people or that is legible to people, um, you know, that that itself is, is kind of scary. But Janet, I, I saw you nodding at the at, at some of what Terry was saying. And I wonder if you wanted to add to that. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot, there's two kinds of people out there. Some people are very risk averse and some people will, you know, leap in the net will appear. Um, you know, we started this company uh, 10 plus years ago um, and I had a friend come up to me because she's looking into starting her own company and, and her question was sort of, when did you, when, when was your point or how much money was your point where you would stop investing in the company and go, oh, well, I guess that didn't work out. And I'm like, I didn't have that point. When my, when my eight <laughs> credit cards I got ahead of time were maxed out and I spent my line of credit and had to said that, you know, that was, you have to sort of believe in yourself that this is going to happen and know that it might not in worst case scenario you can just sell the house and start from scratch again know that you're employable and go get a job but uh, there's a lot of people that won't necessarily take those chances and uh and i think they really should because if you you're headstrong and you're in something um you know sometimes it takes the perfect storm of right place right time right person but you're not going to find that perfect storm if you don't try Thank you, Janet. I, and, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking a lot about what it meant to take those risks and how to identify different points in, you know, one's trajectory where you think, oh, this was a moment of change or, oh, this was a moment where of stepping up. Uh, and, 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 you know, I know we had talked a little bit about thinking about characteristics of, of a great leader and, and, or things that we look for in leadership. Uh, and, and, you know, I want to invite you to talk about that. But I also wanted to ask, uh, sort of, related to that, if there was a moment where you knew that you had become a leader, where, you know, and I know this is like a left, you know, this question is coming up from kind of nowhere because we hadn't talked about it in advance, but as no, you were talking, no. I was just thinking, like, I, is there a moment where you're like, I'm leading, like, yeah, I'm in charge? And I think there's a big difference from having, you know, what I talked about before, kind of those leadership qualities. Uh, as I said, I, I got the label Pushy Janet from a really early age and, and, and took that as a compliment because that's just how I was. Um, but it really, it hit me once I owned the company for a while, you know, it was just the three founders. And as we started to, to develop a staff and bring people on board, um, it actually kind of took them coming to me saying like, you're such a great boss because of you. I actually went out and did this or, you know, you inspired me and so now I'm doing this. And I'm like, wow. Well, that's kind of cool. Um, and our customers as well. We, you know, the thing I'm most proud of about Up Terrace is we've got like high 90s retention. I still have the first customer we signed 10 years ago. Um, and when we set out to build the company, I said what was important to me is to really listen to our customers, take what they say and build it into our product to make it better. And I've worked for so many companies where that's been the sort of credo but that's not at all what they do. But we made it very important to us that this is what was gonna happen. And, and our customers tell that to us all the time. If they do reference calls, they go, you know, they're a great company, have a great solution, but it's the people, you wanna work with these people. Um, and when we started hearing things like that, that, that's the thing that kind of gave me goosebumps and said, wow, I think we actually built something really good here. And, you know, people wanna come work for us and enjoy, you know, how they can contribute to what we do. So again, that, that's kind of what I'm most proud of and, and what I think differentiates our company from those I've worked for um, and from some of the other ones that we actually compete with. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I wonder, Jane, if, if, you, if you had a thought about this because the, the word people's in your title and, and, 
and just thinking about what Janet's saying about how listening became a thing that differentiated, you know, the kind of leadership that that she's performing, but also that people are drawn to. And and I think when when I hear about the importance of listening, I actually, as a professor, think about the relationship between reading and listening, the way in which reading, you know, learning. We said we talk about critical reading all the time, and and sometimes our students are a bit befuddled by what we mean by that. And and I say, you know. Any, you know, we all learn to read, but reading critically, you know, reading for what's between the lines, reading for what's in the margins, I mean, that's what's going to situate you as somebody who can also hear what else is happening in the world. And so I wonder if you, if you wanted to jump on any of that, um, Jane. Well, from a, from a leadership perspective, I, listening is, is really critical. I mean, kind of going back to those, those, that list of C's that I think Terry shared, you know, there's so many, listening is kind of critical to so many of them. Uh, when you're exercising curiosity, when you're, when you're being um, collaborative, when you're being caring, when you're exercising empathy, I mean, it, there's this underpinning of really authentically wanting to know something outside of yourself and, and seeing that information as essential to advancing the whole. And not, not believing that you have all the answers is a really critical part of leadership. Mm. Seeking others' input in a really true way. Not, not because you feel like you have to check the box and say, oh, I'm being collaborative today. I'm listening to other people's points of view and I'm trying to get them to agree with me. You know, that, that's a big turning point. I think when you stop thinking of leadership as convincing others that you're right, you start thinking of leadership as listening to multiple perspectives and to your point, um, Lily, trying to hear in between what people are saying as well um, and finding what knits everybody together. What is, what's the common denominator? What, are, what is everyone trying to solve for? How do you, how do you elevate the, the whole, the whole um, question so that everyone um, sees it as being connected to what, what matters to them the most? So that, that ability to find cohesion, um, I think is, a critical skill of great leaders and, uh, and, and really driving to unity ultimately and recognizing that there's all those polarities out there, right? There, and they're always going to be those tension points, but it's finding the balance and the tension that really, really matters. So I, I, I mean, you asked the question, when did you think of yourself as a leader? I, I mean, I, I, I guess, it, you know, I, I see it in the way other people look to me as opposed to me ever kind of labeling myself that. I remember when I started in my career, I didn't want to manage people. I was just, I was horrified by the idea of that responsibility being on my shoulders. And, uh, and I really thought that it would, I would lack independence. Oh, Jane, I, oh, 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 there you are. Sorry, you cut out for just a minute. Oh, and I? then I was, I was just hanging on what you were saying. <laughs> but thank you, I, I got to, I didn't want to manage people and I was horrified. <laughs> and then I, then I stopped right there. Yeah, so, so I, like, I really thought that that responsibility would stop me from being able to, as Janet said, you know, kind of be true to me, that I would now need to represent, you know, a unit in the organization and I wouldn't have the same voice. I wouldn't be able to be as independent a thinker. I wouldn't be able to push boundaries as hard and as fast because I'd have to be worried about the ramifications to my team and all that sort of stuff. And you know what, I, I really, I think that might be the watershed moment for me of realizing that, um, that it was a much more fulfilling life to elevate others than it was to, um, to keep on pursuing my, you know, my own ideas. And uh, I think that was probably the turning point for me. That is so inspiring in part because, you know, I think on the world stage now, we are given a lot of examples of leadership where there's this idea that, you know, somehow if you're in charge, you're supposed to have all the questions and you're supposed to tell people what to do. And you're supposed to uh, have this vision that doesn't necessarily come from the people around you, but is, you know, magically <laughs> emerging, you know, from, from your head, like Athena from the head of Zeus or whatever. And, and that's not, you know, what you're telling me is that's not what it is. That in fact, a lot of what leadership involves is listening and building and bringing people together and letting themselves um, see each other in you and you in them. And there's, you know, it's this beautiful sense of um, permeability almost in terms of, uh, 
it, what it means to, to lead, which is so different than a kind of fortress mentality around, you know, building up your defenses and, and charging people around. Um, Sandeep, I wonder if you have any thoughts about this or if there's a moment where you thought, oh, I'm definitely a leader. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you asked that question and I, I, I sometimes like still don't really feel like a leader. Like I have these moments where something will happen and um, like there's, you know, like I think outwardly people are probably like, oh, like, you know, I remember when I saw my office was moved to the executive um, level uh, at PwC. So I was a couple doors down from the CEO. So I was like, okay, I guess now this is what leadership feels like. I have a nice view of the CN Tower and I'm like <laughs> floor that's locked. But like, you know, I still like, even as much this, this weekend, I got an email from someone that I mentor and he was thankful because he got a job. And I kind of turned to my husband and I was like, oh, you know, this is so cool. Like, I can't believe I kind of helped somebody with something like that. And so, you know, I don't always see myself as a leader, even though maybe the outward like world might see me. I, if I go back to what I said, what a leader means to me, it's like really standing up for and doing what's right and, and being aligned with your values. And so that's how I've really am living my life. So it's nice to see that people are recognizing that that's valuable and then that I'm able to help. Um, and the other reason that I don't know if I entirely always feel like a leader is I'm still growing. Like there's so much growth that I feel like I still need to do. And part of that really stems from, I think what Annika said is like, for me, like, you know, I'm a child of an immigrant. I've grown up without a huge network of people. Um, I can't, I've had to pave my own way. And there's still a lot of question marks. Like even at this point in my career, I have lots of questions around where do I want to go and what do I want to do? And um, feeling like, you know, I'm not fully there yet. So it's a really interesting question that you asked because I don't always feel like a leader. I just feel like here I am kind of climbing up. I'm not even climbing up. I'm just kind of working hard and doing what I feel is right and best. Um, and so it's it's these kind of nice moments where people do recognize that I've added value to their life or to their organization. And that for me is really, I think it feels good and I hope to continue to do more of that. It's so inspiring to hear the ways in which all of you are expressing this deep courage and strength that comes from you know, embracing uncertainty, you know, embracing what can't necessarily be known. And I, and I, I'm just, I'm just soaking all this up. And I, and um, Anika, I wonder if you had some thoughts on this, if you, if there was a moment where you thought I'm, I'm definitely leading <laughs> uh, or, or, or just anything about what's, what we've just been talking about. I think much of what's been shared about, especially um, Sandeep, I think I relate to what you're sharing in that, um, I actually didn't really have a definition of what I wanted, what would, what would it mean for me now, or oh, I'm a leader now, um, other than just being my authentic self. And at Terry, you really put it down right where you mentioned your C's in terms of caring, like that's essentially where the core of how I, I operate with anyone, my way of being with anyone. And so I, I, if I were to find that pivotal moment where I felt like, oh, I'm, I'm being the leader that I if I aspire to be, um, or have, I'm a leader now, it would be where my team feels really safe with me in failing and making mistakes. Um, trust me when I say, just make your decision and you go ahead and do, I trust you. And, um, and also where we're just, you know, um, collaborating on a level that is honest and transparent and doing well. If I were to really choose another point um, beyond my working with my colleagues, it might be at this point in time, um, I'm starting to get, I'm being, I'm coming clear on my purpose, if you will, and the responsibility that I carry with the various inter you know, intersections that I have. So, you know, throughout my career, I haven't had an example um, there was a time early, well, seven years into my career where I sat down with an organizational um, psychologist who was doing a leadership assessment on me. And he asked me the question, do you have any role models for leadership? And I sat there 
like for a long time quietly. And then my tears started to betray me because I actually didn't have any. Um, and it was, I, you know, I kept thinking about it. I didn't have any role models to, to that, that I felt represented who I wanted to be as a leader because nobody looks like me. And so um, it was so funny. I ended up chuckling it off and saying Oprah because I really didn't have anybody uh, in, at that time. And so if I bring that to today, you know, I think it's, this topic is so important on this matter because I think women in leadership, we need more of, but I would also say racialized women in leadership and particularly black women in leadership and having those examples. And so bringing it to this time, I, where I say I found my purpose and what leadership is starting to look like for me, it's, it's in using that responsibility and using my lived experience and what matters to me to influence. So, um, and so what has that looked like? It's looked like, you know, actually um, stepping out and being vulnerable, sharing my journey with others. It looks like um, using my voice in a very intentional way to help others to understand the importance of anti-racism. Um, it, and it looks like, um, you know, uh, taking the chance when there are others in the room who won't agree with you. Um, so, yeah, so I would say that's, and I'm sorry, I went on so long about it, but oh, that's- Oh, no, I'm just, I'm like, I'm, my heart is exploding. <laughs> and so, <laughs> like, I mean, all of what you're saying means so much, and, and especially, you know, around just what it means to look for yourself in the world around you, um, and to try to, you know, what and what you do when you don't necessarily see the things you need to see, you know, how you build that, how you carve that out. And I, I also do think, you know, Anika, that there's just so much of what you're saying around um, vulnerability and around sharing your journey, which I, uh, you know, I, I know personally for me is, is, you know, I'm an academic and so we're always told to be super objective and to never talk about ourselves if we can help it. And, um, and it took me a really long time to be able to say in the, within the university setting, you know, like no one in my family went to university. Um, I didn't know what a master's degree was. Like I had no idea what those things were. And, and to know now, of course, it's it's very important to say those things so that all the people around me who might also be thinking that or feeling that can also know that that's happening. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, that, that means so much, you know, the, the idea of vulnerability, which ties into the kind of permeability that Sandeep was talking about, um, and Janet and, 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 and Terry, I wonder if I, I could bring it to you because, you know, the idea of you, you're the one who brought to the word care into, into our conversation early on as, as a founding kind of principle for how your, um, uh, organization thinks about leadership and it, it really struck me because we don't think about caring necessarily as a as a leadership quality necessarily I mean I I, I now do and it's you know printed into my <laughs> I'm never going to forget that um, but I, you know caring is often seen as a vulnerability as a sign of weakness you know being caring too much having your office door open too, too often or taking too many meetings where people just want to tell you what's happening in their lives. Uh, I, and I wonder if you have some thoughts about that. I have, I have thoughts on caring and I have some thoughts on leadership too. As I, you know, I'm listening to my panelists here talk about they don't see themselves as a leader. I see, I see myself as somebody that has influence. I influence our teams. Uh, we're a $3 billion organization globally. And I look around the landscape of our complex matrix organization, and I see a ton of great leaders. And so I don't ever really see myself as somebody who is a leader because I see so many around me that I aspire to be. I just see myself as someone who's leading from where I am today. And with all the skills and all the tools that I, in my journey, it's, and it's been a long journey to get where I am. And, and I think about what, if, 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 if what I have is, is influence and, and you can't see me, I'm, by the way, I'm six feet tall. I put on a pair of heels. I'm six, three, I walk into a boardroom. I recognize that I can be very intimidating just from a sheer size perspective. 
And so I've made a really intentional effort to be that caring person. I have got where I've got in my career because people recognize things that I didn't in myself or I wasn't actually gonna even articulate it as a skill set. They recognized it and then they elevated me. So that's, I'm intentionally trying to do that with other women. We call it allyship. I'm not sure if that's a standard word within the university, um, but that's something that I'm trying to do. And I think that's about caring. It's about caring who about that individual is. It's about caring what, what their interests are, where they want to be in life. And we're the same as every organization. Well, maybe not every, but especially in our industry, we don't have enough women leaders. We don't have enough women partners sitting at an executive table. And so to Anika's point, it's hard to look upwards and, and not see and see role models that you can aspire to be. And the ones that are there seem to be unattainable, working 75 hour work weeks, trying to raise children, outsourcing it most of the time. And so it doesn't look attainable either. So we're facing a crisis of people just leaving different industries because of this. And I, I, so I'm trying to just put a different lens on that and really mentor and ally young leaders, knowing that well, that will probably help me in the long run because I'm going to help them. <laughs> I'm going to help them aspire to be what they are good at. And it's just paying attention to that. And I'm not sure enough people do, to be honest. That is so resonant with so much of what we see, what we need in the world, I think, especially now when everybody is really very isolated in our workplaces and, in, and mm -hmm. you know, not just in our social lives, but in our workplaces and, and the world that we're forced to inhabit in this current moment, but which will also, I think, you know, carry forward in all kinds of ways. I, you know, I, I there are a ton of questions from the audience. So I've been selfishly keeping you all to myself, <laughs> and, um, but I'm going to actually pivot now a little bit to uh, some of the questions that we've been getting from people who are in the, in the virtual room with us. And I'm actually going to read um, the, the questions as, as, I'm, as, as I am receiving them. Uh, and I have a question from Angela, and she asks, she says, hi, <laughs> something that struck me as important, but not often well received by others, is allowing yourself to fail. What advice would you suggest to allow oneself to feel this vulnerability? And I know we've already talked a bit about the importance of failing and doing it well and doing it fast and not, you know, letting it not letting yourself get stuck <laughs> in that moment of failure. Uh, so I wonder, Janet, do you want to start us off on this one? I'll take, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, I never think like all of us think of failure as a bad thing. You know, you, you can't fail if you don't try um, and you have to. I sadly will bring up a, a pop reference of uh, something I just saw where someone said, goldfish have a very short memory. So <laughs> goldfish right? Just get back up and take what you've learned and move on to the next thing. So uh, failing is not, is not always a bad thing. And, and, you know, not being perfect, you don't have to be perfect either. You don't necessarily have to fail, but you know, you, you can go out there and you may have a completely different outcome than what you may have set forward to do in the first place, but that could be radically different and much better, you know, things evolve. So I think rather than looking at it as failure is looking at it as the evolution of getting from A to B. It may not be the exact path that you would, had laid out, um, but you'll, you'll get to B, just, just keep swimming. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Jane, do, you wanna jump in on that? Yeah, I, I, I do, I, I think that we, we label things as failures and that's what stops us. You know, it, it, I, and I think that Jen is getting at that. You know, it's, it's really just about learning. Yeah. And, and sometimes, sometimes learning is painful and, and hard, um, and, and sometimes it's easier and you feel like you're in the flow, but I, but I would encourage everyone to have the courage to take those opportunities that you might feel like you're not qualified for. Like in the moment, you might be like, that's too big a leap. I don't know that I can do that job. I would just encourage you to take advantage of the opportunities that come your way and, and learn as much as you can from them. Grab as much as you can to learn as much as you can, as fast as you can. And that includes learning from failure as fast as you can. Just always learn as much as you can, as fast as you can. And, uh, Even though it hurts? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, failing because hurts, part, man. <laughs> well, but part of, part of learning is, is the pain, unfortunately, right? Um, but but it's, uh, it, it's always something that adds to the journey and helps get you someplace else. 
you know, when you, when you kind of look back on those experiences, they're always really critical to who you become as a person. You can't shy away from it. It's also yes, how you indeed. react to the, it's yeah. also how you actually react to the failure, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's to recognize that it's gonna happen and exactly what um, Jane said that it's just gonna, it's about moving on, but it's recognizing that you've, you've got what it takes to pick yourself up and learn, like look at, reflect on what you've done and pivot to make change. And the reason I, I would say that you've got what it takes, I think going back to the degree that you ha you're gonna get at York around the critical skill sets that you're picking up, the ability to process and synthesize and make judgments, like you've got that, right? You've actually at a core level have certain skill sets. It's now then saying, okay, this didn't work. What do I need to do? next time or this time to to move around and make this work so i think that is the most critical lesson is that it's it's not to give up um because the failures are like you're gonna the failures come fast and um and can go fast too right if you actually pivot and, and figure out and learn from the lesson yeah where what i'd add to that is that the gem in the in the learning from the failure is also in the sharing so it's where, where it makes sense that you, you help others along by sharing your learnings and what your mistakes were, not so that they avoid them, but so much as actually helping to build on the experience because there's much to gain from it. That's so helpful, Anika. And, and Terry, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to any of this about failing and, and not being, being open to the vulnerability of it. <laughs> So, so I think I think what we're really talking about here is resilience, right? At the end of the day, and I don't know that when I've done things, I recognized it as a failure, so I wasn't trying it on to fail. I, I I would try things, and I still try to do something every day that makes me feel super uncomfortable, uh, that I mm -hmm. that I feel awkward with, whether it's a conversation that I have to have, which I love putting those conversations off, especially the hard ones. Um, so, so I try and do something that just feels really uncomfortable. And then every day I just build more and more confidence so that when I do come up to a problem that I'm probably, that I might fail at, I don't know until it happens, <laughs> I, I can still get back up the next day. Cause I think that's what I heard on from, maybe it was Jane that said that, right. I'm resilient enough. I I've tried things outside of my comfort zone. And then it's easier when I do fail that I can just go attack something the next day. That would be my only addition to it. Yeah. You guys just fill me with so much inspiration. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. That's really, I mean, you're right. I mean, not you know, all of you are just talking a lot about what what you gain in that in this moment of university is also what you take forward around learning to move uh, forward, which is of course the theme of, of our discussion. And, and in fact, I want to come to the next question in the Q and A because it connects with what we what you've all just said, and and particularly I think what Sandeep just said in terms of. Uh, the liberal arts degree and, and what you're getting from it is, is when you said, you know, you've got this, <laughs> you know, this is a, this is a thing that I don't know if our students hear enough, you know, where we say, you know, and in fact, you know, the resources you, you know, what you need to be in the world, you have, you know, what you, what you want to do in university is, is bring that forward is to, 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 to find it in yourself. Um, and, and I often say to my students, you know, the world's, a, I know it's scary, but the world's a big place and there's a place for you in it. And, and I know that, you know, that doesn't always seem obvious, but we have a question from the audience. Um, Ronique asks about, you know, about tr skills transfer, you know, in, in a society or workforce that is so competitive um, Renique worries that her sociology degree, which is, a, uh, which is a social science and liberal arts degree, on its own just won't cut it in terms of the hard skills that are transferable to the workforce in comparison to other degrees. Do you feel that it is important to supplement a liberal arts degree with something else like a human resources certificate or a business administration certificate? Um, so some, you know, what do I, what do you, what would you say to someone who says, you know, maybe I'm, what I'm doing is not enough? I'd like to take that. So for Thanks. me, um, so I learned, I think a couple of years ago that there's this lifespan of um, knowledge now, and it used to be something like 12 years and now it's, a, and then it was six years and now it's something like two years and it's going to get even shorter because of how fast things are changing and evolving right and so 
having the skill set in a particular subject and a matter area may be helpful. And it might be helpful to get you into an organization or get you and differentiate you early on in your career. But what I would say is think about what it is that you want to do. And you can definitely, you know, I'm a lifelong learner. So I say you should go out and do what you want, what you think will give you an advantage, but to rely on that certificate or whatever to be the crux that's gonna carry you through your career is not gonna happen. I think it'd be something that gets your foot in the door. But what I will say is that degree and what we've talked about around that critical thinking, um, the, the love of learning that you're gonna get, if we think about you're an English ma major and we talked about empathy that you're learning by reading, like those core skill sets, I think are gonna help take you through uh, your career. And, and for me, I, I said this at the outset, my, my liberal arts degree is something I use every single day. And it's not that fact that I learn in my Caribbean studies class that I carry with me every day, it's the critical thinking that I take with me every day. And what I said is that love for learning, understanding that I don't know everything and that I've got to continue to learn. And, you know, based on, I mean, I sit and I've sat in the HR function, I sit in the HR function now, and this is all we talk about around how do we help get people into the organization, get them ready for what the future of work is gonna look like. And we as leaders don't know what the future of work is gonna look like, but what we know and the skill sets that we're looking for are those human skill sets that we just talked about, right? Growth mindset, agility, um, critical thinking. So that's, that's sort of my perspective on it. That's yeah, so I, would, I would add to that, Sandeep, that's, I mean, that's exactly what I would say as well. And, you know, this notion of squiggly career path. Um, so it's, you know, using your education as a foundation, um, but then also knowing that you, you may actually, your journey may look very different from where you started. Um, you know, my CEO, uh, she started, she, she studied history, right? She's the CEO of a publisher. Uh, Mine's a little bit more practical. I did, I studied sociology as well, and then ended up going down. I also had the same concern when I was preparing to uh, leave university, which led me down the path of human resources, but that was more me taking an internal inventory of what I really wanted to do. And even though at the time that I was graduating, HR wasn't where it is today in terms of when we talk about people first, you know, caring, empathy, it was more business focused and it was really hard to get into HR at that time. It was, you had to have, you had to have a finance degree or something else to get into HR. So um, all that's all to say that, you know, yes, it, it, there's some element of wanting to be practical and, in, in, you know, landing that first job for yourself. But I would say a lot of employers are now down the road of really looking for those critical skills that are, are, are that can be found in essentially any liberal arts, um, or humanities background. Um, and as long as you can harness those things for yourself and take some time to reflect on what are the things that are very important to you to demonstrate every day, uh, that's where you'll find your transferable skills. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if any of the other panelists want to jump in on that or I can move us to the next question. I don't want to be too fast, but uh, I, I, I I have a question from Carolyn about following up on some of what you just said, Anika, about um, transferable skills, but also, you know, for, as an English professor, this question always hits home to me. Uh, and it's a question from Caroline where she says, you know, in the English program, there are a large number of students who are aiming to be teachers. And I'm not sure teaching is a path I want to pursue. Have any of you ever thought about teaching and what made you decide to choose the careers that you're in now? And I, I'm sure that especially for maybe not just for the English majors, but there's always this like, what are you going to do with that? Teach? And then you think, stop asking me those questions. The world's a big place. <laughs> um, but would anybody like to jump in on that question around um, whether or not you thought about teaching and how you decided you know, if there was there a moment where you thought, you know what, you know, this is this degree is actually not about teaching; it's about these other skills that I want to bring to the world. Well, I'll I take it. Actually, oh, sorry, go ahead. Janet. Yeah, how about uh, Terry and Janet? <laughs> okay, so so that was my that was actually my journey. So you're actually talking to me. I I took English because I was going to be a teacher, and I wanted to do that desperately. And then I did a co-op and I was uh, working in a kindergarten classroom. And then I decided this is definitely not for me. <laughs> uh, and maybe it was the age, 
but but I actually didn't know that. So I continued to, I thought maybe I, I was judging it too quickly. And so I actually just happened to trip on another opportunity. Uh, I my parents dragged me to the golf and travel show one year and I used to I used to play a lot of golf and I was in my last year of university and my parents said, hey, you should go talk to that booth over there for the CPA. CPGA was the Canadian Professional Golf Association. I went to talk to them and learned that I could become a golf professional, run my own business, run a pro shop, run tournaments. Uh, I could be outside for the majority of the season. What I later learned was that meant all summer when my friends were all having fun, which I didn't actually totally love anyway. But it, it just, there was an opportunity that presented itself and I took it. So then I became a professional golf. I played, played the Canadian tour for a little while. A couple Whoa. Of years. <laughs> Found out I needed more than $8,000 a year to live. And then, uh, and then one of my clients offered me a job. So it was just, it's been haphazard. It wasn't planned. It's definitely not what I thought it was going to look like. Uh, but every time a door opened, I stepped through it. And, and it was that that's got me to where I am today, plus surrounding myself with a bunch of champions. So that is so revelatory, Janet. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to say almost the exact same thing, but coming at it from a different perspective. Um, I'm an English major because I loved reading and I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a doctor. I, I knew I didn't have to take any kind of specific course to do what I wanted to do, which who knew what that was when you start university. So I took something I love and did what I love. Um, and I think people have said it, that education gives you a foundation to think critically, to um, know how to get something done from start to finish, know how to respect a deadline. I mean, these are, you know, so many other skills that matter. Um, and it really was that then go out, get to know people, start to network, you know, build your own reputation up by how you act in the office, be that caring person, um, be the person that contributes you know, be the person that will stand up for what's right and, you know, want to share with other people and, and learn from other people. And then that reputation takes you so far. It opens so many doors for you, whether it be um, another position at a different company. If someone moves, well, I really want this person working with me too. They were so helpful. You know, want to move on over to this company or whether it's you're going out and asking for seed money. You, you absolutely, you, you stand on your reputation and, and people believe in you and want to help. Um, so I think degrees that aren't necessarily targeted for some specific career, and I go back to like your legal career, you take the courses that everyone tells you to take because you're going to go out and article and then become a lawyer and it's sort of the steps are laid out. Um, but anything not like that, just be open to the opportunities that it brings to you and, and you'll find something and sort of naturally fall into, hey, I, you know, I'm kind of really good at doing this. I didn't even know this existed as a career when I was at school, but but now I love it and I'm going to be, become really good at it. So I think it's, it's uh, you don't have to be a teacher. If you have an English degree, you can start a tech company if you want. <laughs> Not just as an example, yeah. Sandeep. Yeah. 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 I just want to add, so I'm going to bring it from a racialized person's perspective as well, because um the reason I'm going to bring it is because it's not as easy when you're racialized or immigrant and you don't have a large network and your my parents for example worked my mom worked at Tim Hortons my dad worked in a factory and so for me having a clearer path was critically important because first of all at the time that I graduated even sort of we know right now I work in the space of DNI you know, people of color, people with racialized names or non-English signing names have a harder time finding their first role, finding, um, you know, getting callbacks. And part of that is we're not as networked, right? I did not know anyone who worked anywhere other than a factory or was a taxi driver. Like that was my parents' network. Um, and so I think it's, it's easy for us now and easy even for me to say now to my kids, like, you know, just don't worry, like, you know, figure out what you want to do and doors will open. Doors didn't entirely open for people like me, right? And so for me, having that clear path was important. The advice that I wish I had gotten, I did get when I was um, articling and I had people support me was to build your network and think about who is in your network. And if you don't have people, you know, my neighbor now is an angel investor. The other ones, um, you know, works in the financial sector. So my kids have huge opportunities, right? Um, but 
Um, so what I would say to those of you on the call who don't have a big network is people are generous, right? Reach out to people, get on LinkedIn, think about who you know, who's where, and start meeting people and having conversations like this about their career journey and about what you might want to do or thinking of doing. Get to know what is out there because all I knew was, all my parents knew was like, you go to school, you get a degree and you can get a job in that field. I didn't know that you could be, you know, there's all these roles in corporations that you could play, that you could do learning and development, that you could do, you know, like there's just a whole host of things that people can do with their lives that I had no idea that you could do. So um, my one big piece of advice for those of you just sitting there in the similar situation is lean into connect with people. I mean, when we physically start getting back to seeing people, meet people, and you'll be surprised at how generous people are with their time, especially if you just say, I just want to learn a little bit more about how you got to where you're going. Um, and then at the end of that conversation, say, is there anyone else you can suggest I could speak to? Because I, I go ahead. I totally, no, that's it. I totally agree with you with the networking piece. I mean, um, yes, I come from a totally different, you know, background as you, um, but my parents certainly were not well connected at all. But I started my networking in university. I would talk to my professors. I got reference letters for them before I graduated. Um, the fellow students, you know, you find out who, who they are and do they have siblings or parents in industries that interest you. Um, and, and that's how I got my first job actually right out of university as a friend I met at school sister worked at CBC. And I heard about a job and got in, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to come from your background, although I'm, I'm sure it is much more difficult. Uh, start soon, start in school, start now networking and, and getting to know who, who's around you and, and peeking around to see what doors you could possibly push through. I love this conversation so much and I am heart, a little heartbroken because we're at time and uh, and I just, you know, I, I love how much generosity and care all of you have brought to this conversation and the doors that you are opening by sharing the stories that you've done, that you've had and that you've experienced. It means so much to everyone, I think, in this room with us. And even though you can't see them, I hope you feel um, how much uh, care and love they're bringing to you and to this conversation. It means so much. I am so grateful, and I know I speak for everyone at York um, when we talk about how grateful we are to our students and how much we learn from our students every day. And we never stop learning from you. It's a lifelong journey for the university as well. <laughs> uh, and so I um, invite you all to come back to York when we open again and see the campus in all of its glory. It's a very beautiful and interesting place now. I know that our students um, would be thrilled to see you and talk to you again, uh, but mostly thank you, thank you Please take care of yourselves and keep inspiring us the way you are and leading and being such incredible ambassadors for what it means to move forward as women leaders. Thank you.